can I invite you to turn uh, to Joshua chapter 9. Be our Bible reading tonight. Joshua chapter 9. Let's read the God-breathed word of God together. Now, when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, those in the hill country, in the western foothills, and along the entire coast of the great sea, as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they came together to make war against Joshua and Israel. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went, as a dele- they went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. The men put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. The men of Israel said to the Hivites, But perhaps you live near us. How then can we make a treaty with you? We are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, Who are you and where do you come from? They answered, Your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, Take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home, and on the day we left to come to you. But now... See how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. The men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live. And the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors living near them. So the Israelites set out and on the third day came to their cities, Gibeon, Kephirah, Beeroth, and Kiriath-Jerim. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders. But all the leaders answered, We have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. This is what we'll do to them. We'll let them live so that wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath we swore to them. They continued, Let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers for the entire community. So the leader's promise to them was kept. Then Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said, Why did you deceive us by saying we live a long way from you? Well, actually, you live near us. You are now under a curse. You will never cease to serve as woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, Your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out all its inhabitants before from before you so we feared for our lives because of you and that is why we did this we are now in your hands do to us whatever seems good and right to you so joshua saved them from the israelites and they did not kill them that day he made the gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the community and for the altar of the lord at the place of the lord would choose and that is what they are to this day he who has ears to hear let him hear The word of the Lord. 
Let's pray together. Our Father, we recognize that this is not just a book. This is your word. And we acknowledge that it came to the author Moses, not because he wanted to write an account of what happened to the Israelites, but because by the power of the Holy Spirit, you so moved upon him that when he penned these words, they were penned exactly as you wanted them penned. And so we know that when we read your word, we have in front of us the word of God. You speak to us through your word. Your word is just as much valid today as it was when it was first written. And so we pray that you would help us to understand, to grasp, to hear your voice to us. For you are speaking through your word. And we ask that as you speak to us, in some way we would be changed. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I thought I was still in Exodus when I came to authorship. Some of you would get that. In late September 1864, the Confederate General in the United States, General Nathan Bedford Forrest, was leading his troops north from Decatur, Alabama, towards Nashville. But to make it to Nashville, Forrest had to um, defeat the Union Army at Athens, Alabama. When the Union commander, Colonel Wallace Campbell, refused to surrender, Forrest asked for a personal meeting and took Campbell out on an inspection of his troops. But each time they left a detachment, the Confederate soldiers simply packed up, moved to another position, artillery and all, and Forrest and Campbell would then arrive at the new encampment and continue to tally up the impressive number of Confederate soldiers and weaponry. By the time they'd returned to Fort, Campbell was convinced he couldn't win and surrendered unconditionally. What a deception. To simply take your troops and move them somewhere else and then take the general and say, here, have a look at this, and then move them somewhere else and take them somewhere else and say, here they are. But this is exactly what happens to Joshua. He gets deceived by well-sounding Arguments. This group of people come from a supposedly faraway land. The deception seems to be true. It seems to be valid in terms of what they're experiencing and where they've come from. And yet Joshua doesn't inquire of the Lord. That is the key phrase in this whole episode. Joshua doesn't inquire of the Lord. And as a result of that, he enters into a compromising situation for the whole of Israel that is going to have ramifications well after he's dead. One of the commands that were given in Deuteronomy 7, if you remember, is that God said they are to wipe out everyone in the land of Canaan. It is God's righteous judgment against a land that has been sinning against him for hundreds of years. And that command given to Moses was passed down to Joshua. So once they get into the land, they ought to wipe everyone out as per God's command. And leaving people in the land and allowing themselves to become deceived would cause this people to become an enduring snare for Joshua and the people that followed him. And so the Israelites into the future would enter into the same worship as the pagan nations. And this group that belonged to the Hivites ultimately would lead Israel astray along with others in the land, ultimately resulting in exile. The peril of compromise. And when we look at this episode of Joshua, you kind of think at this stage, surely Joshua's learned his lesson. We've had AI that's already happened. They got defeated, and then 
Joshua found out what the problem was, and so they corrected the problem. They've just celebrated victory against Ai. And now, having celebrated this great victory against this small city Ai, you think that Joshua would now be in a position to ensure that the same kind of thing doesn't happen again. He's been deceived once. Surely this time he'll get it right. And while from a distance you and I can look at that and say, come on, Joshua, wake up to yourself. Is not, is not Joshua's story your and my story? Are we not sometimes drawn into compromising situations? Because spiritually, we're not where we ought to be. Because spiritually, we haven't been guarding our lives. Because spiritually, we've allowed ourselves to languish. And the disciplines of being a disciple, that's what it means to be a disciple, to be disciplined that we've lost, has caused us to become vulnerable. And in our vulnerable situation, we find ourselves doing things that we know we ought not to do, but we almost feel an inner compulsion to do. Perhaps it's watching that movie that you know you shouldn't have watched. Perhaps it's an angry confrontation you have with a husband or a wife. Or it's a loss of temper with your children. Or it's a swear word that slips out here and there. Or the misuse of your finances. But the same danger that Joshua faced, you and I face. And so often we fall into compromise when we are not in intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We were chatting uh, recently with Nathan and Will. We try and meet up regularly and just chat. And they were both saying of how if they don't spend time in the morning with the Lord, it can have an inf impact on the rest of their day. And how easy it is, whether your devotional time is morning or evening, I generally have mine in the evening, though I also have one in the morning. But generally speaking, it's so easy when you are not connected to God. I know for me that if I want to blow it, if I want to make a fool of myself, the best way of doing that is by skipping my quiet time and not praying regularly. And then inevitably, it happens. And so this is a wonderful reminder to you and I to stay the course, to keep our spiritual life robust and active before God and to avoid the peril of compromise. How do we do that? Well, number one, compromise is deceptively subtle. It's deceptively subtle. You know, it's not that the devil comes to you and says, Ian Dean, there's someone who's just given you a raw deal. Just go and murder them. It's not going to happen. Because we know those big things are not the kinds of things that we are going to get led into. It's very unlikely. But the devil comes along and in very subtle ways, he begins to whisper in your ear the same deception that Adam and Eve struggled with. Did God really say are you sure that by doing this thing that you're actually going to be compromising? Surely it's not that big a deal in your life. Surely a little thing here and there, a little white lie here and a little white lie there, it's not a big deal. After all, you're doing it to protect the person by lying to them. And we get drawn into this web as we would discover with Joshua. Look at verses 3 to 13. I'm not going to read them for the sake of time. It's an elaborate deception. Interestingly, in verses 1 through to 3, the surrounding nations share about what's happening, and they are emboldened, probably because they haven't heard of the defeat of Ai yet, but have heard of certainly when Joshua made a mess of it initially. And so these kings get together, and this is going to be a constant problem that's going to resurrect its ugly head in chapters 10 and 11 that Israel is going to have to face. But there's one small little nation that lives about five kilometers northwest of Jerusalem. So from where they are, if they're still at Ai or Gigal, where they offered sacrifices, it's about 32 k's from Ai. So it's not a, it's not a, a long, pla a long uh, pla place away. 
and they have a different response to the surrounding nations and come up with this elaborate plan. And I mean, it looks pretty genuine, doesn't it? When you think about it, I mean, they arrive, they've got old worn out clothes, the breads turn moldy, the wineskins look old, and from an outward external perspective, it seems like a legitimate problem. Yet, even Joshua, initially, you would think, is a little bit suspicious. Because first they engage with the leaders, and then Joshua enters into the picture. And Joshua asks them the same question, where have you come from? And they go through this elaborate story, and they offer some bread, and say, taste this bread, and let's see it. And Joshua is drawn into this deception. They even plead certitude. Notice the, 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 the strategy they have. The, the first thing is they say, look, we, we, we'll, we'll be your servants. So there's a, a sense of almost humility about them. You know, we, we, we don't want a prominent place in, in the land. We, we will just serve. And then they draw him in even further. When they begin to praise God, they give praise to what God has done. We've heard about the great deeds of Yahweh. We've heard about the defeat in Egypt. They're very, very careful. They don't say anything about AI because that's a little bit close. And so they, they talk about things further back in the past to make the deception seem all the more plausible because if they talk about AI, then it's probably because they're quite close and have heard about what's happened to AI. But they don't talk about AI. They talk about what happened in Egypt. And so they talk about the fame and how great God is. And so there's a sense in which they're buttering up Israel. They're buttering up Joshua. They flatter him by God's mighty deeds. They don't mention the country. That's the third nature of their deception. They don't say where they're from. And when Joshua says, where do you come from? It's a generalization. You know, it's, it's, I think they would have done really well if they were living in Victoria and were the premier of Victoria. I think the, the not answering questions, obstification, trying to be general in nature so there's no implications. And they don't mention where they come from because the game is up the moment they do. And Joshua is drawn in. It's not the only time that Israel and prophets experience deception. Do you remember the deception that um, Micaiah had to deal with, with the kings, where the king calls him in and says, prophesy victory. And all the other prophesy, uh, prophets are prophesying victory. And he says, no, I can't, because if I do, I'll be lying before God. Let me read the account if I have a chair I don't I thought I had a chair uh, 1 Kings 13 1 to 24 uh, and 1 Kings 22 1 to 28 and and the king is drawn into all these prophets that are lying and then he slaps him in the face and says get out of here and the king is deceived by these lying prophets going into battle and he loses his life remember the man of God who comes along and is told by God, don't eat anything until you come back. And while he's going back, another prophet comes out to him and says, come home and eat with me. And he says, God told me not to eat with anyone until I get home. And the prophet says, no, but God told me you should eat with me. And immediately that should have raised some danger signals. And he goes and he eats. And then on the way back, God rebukes him through this prophet where he's eaten and he gets mauled by a lion. It's very easy to get deceived. It's very easy to get drawn in. Jesus warns us about false prophets, warns us about being led astray, warns us about not listening to every newfangled doctrine that comes out of the USA, warns us that we don't allow ourselves to be deceived by not exercising discernment and searching the scriptures to verify whether or not the things we are hearing are indeed biblical and it's so easy to get drawn into them. Purpose-driven life, purpose-driven church. How many churches got involved in that? How many churches bought into that paradigm? I know a church that did it three times because of the fading effects of the first and second times. And so you've got to revive it. And so Jesus says to us very clearly, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious as wolves. Then he warns us in John 8, 44, 
You belong to your father, the devil, and you carry out your father's desires, talking to the Pharisees. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Jesus is highlighting the danger of those who are false prophets, those who do speak lies, that ultimately their lies originate from Satan. Let me give you a really good example of this. I remember dealing with a particular person long, long time ago uh, who was listening to Benny Hinn. Do you all know who Benny Hinn is? Benny Hinn is a well-known evangelist in America who's built a ministry on prosperity. And um, I gave this particular person some tapes to listen to that Benny Hinn had blasphemed God by making certain statements that were the equivalent of blasphemy about God. And they went away and they listened to these tapes and they came back to me after a week. And I said, how would you go with those tapes? Did you see the danger of a man like that? And the answer was, I'm convinced that's not Benny Hinn. There was a, 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 they had been so drawn in and so deceived that when the truth was staring them in the face, they were unable to recognize it. Because ultimately when we buy into deception again and again, the deception becomes the truth for us. And we begin to believe the lies and so there is a need for us to exercise discernment. And I've got great news for you because God has given you his word and God has given you the Holy Spirit and God has enabled you and equipped you to be able to discern true from false. And God has given you the ability to recognize those things you need to push away from yourself and distance yourself from. You, you're not left without the ability to, to do that. And so the way in which we ensure that we don't get deceived is we become people of the word. We become people of the book. We bury ourselves in the word so that we know it from back to front. And then when deception comes in the form of false teachers or false prophets, we recognize it. Why? Because we know the truth. And that's why Jesus says the truth sets you free. It does. And then when temptation comes to us, we recognize temptation for what it is. And rather than flirting with temptation and rather than thinking that somehow we're the one that's going to resist the temptation, we are able to push it away because God's word has been buried in the depths of our being. And that's what enables us to combat it. Deception can be very, very enticing at times and you and I need to ensure that we don't neglect nurturing our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ it's the best antidote to being deceived so that when the sa Satan comes and whispers those little things in your ears and says to you it's not really going to hurt it's not really going to do any harm just a little bit of dabbling here and a little bit of dabbling there is okay You need to be able to say, no, it's not. God's word declares. Secondly, compromise is deceptively proud. Is deceptively proud. It knows better. Verse 14. Let me read it because there's only one verse. The men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of Yahweh. Now think about the scenario for a moment. How are you going to know that what is presented to you is not true? Well, the only way that they are going to know is by spending some time seeking an answer from God. They had the imam and the thummim where they could have cast that and they could have spent some time in prayer and they could have sought direction from the Lord and sought his wisdom so that whenever they did make a decision on these people, it would be one directed from God. But what do they do? They do not inquire of the Lord. Lord. 
They thought they had enough resources within themselves to be able to discern truth from falsehood and therefore they relied upon their own abilities without submitting themselves to God and seeking his wisdom in an issue like this. And therein lies the problem, does it not? It's so easy to be tempted into pride to thinking that I can handle it, that I'm strong enough to resist. I always get worried when people say to me, yes, I I know this is a particular temptation, but you know, I'll be okay because I'm strong enough to resist. And then you hear, in fact, they weren't strong enough to resist and they yielded to that temptation. Don't put yourself in the place of temptation. Don't allow yourself to go to those areas where you have particular weaknesses and, and put yourself in the position where those weaknesses are going to be inflamed. If your problem, for example, is pornography, get off your computer. Put things on your phone that will prevent you from being able to access those those things and keep yourself accountable to someone and work in an accountability relationship so that you are regularly being asked by that person how your moral life is going. If your problem is how you use your finances, then you need to seek advice from someone who is more spiritual than you and ask them to help you to get your priorities right. If you have a problem with lying, then learn to not put yourself in situations where you are going to be tempted to lie. Rather than speaking, say nothing. And so we can multiply them out. Remember the disciples in Matthew 26, 33? I mean, we all suffer from this. Jesus says they're going to deny him. Peter stands up on behalf of the rest and says, no way. I'm not going to deny you. And all the other disciples agreed. What happened next? They all fled when Jesus was arrested. They thought they were strong enough. They had spent three years with the Lord Jesus Christ, three years in his intimate company, three years being taught by him, three years being prayed for by him, three years sleeping day and night, going wherever he went, observing his life. And yet, at the end of that three years, when the most critical point in his life comes, when all of them have stood up and said, we will not deny you, put under pressure, all of them fall away. Do you think you're too strong to deny Christ? Do you think you're stronger than the disciples? You see, the moment we get to the point where we think we're above a particular sin, you put yourself into the danger of committing that sin. Because you've entered a place of complacency and you've entered a place of thinking to yourself that I can handle this. Rather submit yourself to God. Rather ask God for strength to resist when those temptations come. Rather recognize your vulnerability. Rather recognize your weakness. Rather recognize your uh, your dependence upon God. Rather come to him on your knees daily and say, Lord, help me. I'm going to face all kinds of temptations today. They're going to assail me. And I know I'm too weak to resist them on my own strength. So Lord, you come, you empower me, you enable me to stand strong when those temptations come. And we rely upon Jesus rather than looking to ourselves. It's so easy to fall prey to our own strength. And sometimes our own pride gets in the way of that. Lord, I'm too proud to acknowledge that you know best for me when it comes to choosing a life partner. So I'll make the choice without any prayer without any guidance, without any asking, without any seeking. I've had couples so sadly stand before me and make vows to each other in the presence of God, in the presence of the company of God's people, and have said, I will love you till the day I die, who have walked away from their marriage vows. 
And maybe they've walked away because they never got down on their knees before they got married and said, Lord, is this the right person? I've had marriages break down where a man or woman has innocently after work or at lunchtime gone for coffee with another man or woman that's not their wife or husband. And as a result of that innocent encounter, it's created problems in the marriage and eventually resulted in adultery and divorce down the line. Ah, oh, but you see, it's not going to happen to me, Ian. I'm, I'm strong enough to resist that. Really? It's so easy to think that somehow we're above certain temptations. Can I say something to you that frightens me? You know, when I read these things about rapists who have committed almost unmentionable acts. You know what scares me? Not what they've done, though it's horrific, but that I'm capable of it, but for the grace of God. Can I say to you as lovingly as possible as you sit here this evening, every single one of you is capable of every single sin under the book. And the only reason you are prevented from committing those sins is by the grace of Almighty God. And the sooner you recognize that, and the sooner I recognize that, and the sooner we humble ourselves under God, the more we will be equipped by God's grace to resist those temptations when they come as deceptive as they are. Your lifeblood, let me tell you, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, I want you to notice, compromise is deceptively devastating. It's deceptively devastating. Look at verses 15 to 27. Again, for the sake of time, I won't read them. Deceptively devastating. The devastating effects for Israel. I mentioned that right at the beginning of the sermon. For Israel, this not destroying the people in the land was going to be an enduring snare for them. Constantly, God would have to send prophet after prophet after prophet to warn his people, to call them out of their idolatry, to call them back to himself, to call for them to repent from their sin. All because right back here, they failed to obey God. They failed to consult God. And now for the rest of their history, as long as they were in the the promised land, they were going to encounter this constant danger of these nations that they had failed to move out of the land. Till eventually it results in the kingdom being split in two. You have the north kingdom of ten tribes, the southern kingdom of two tribes. Eventually the north kingdom falls to Assyria. The southern kingdom falls to Babylon and God takes these people out into exile into Babylonia and there they languish for 70 years can you see the long-term devastating effects that this particular episode contributed to in the life of the Israel it wasn't the only thing that caused them to do that But it was a contributing factor because they failed to listen to God in Deuteronomy 7. Now that they've entered into a treaty, they rightly recognize they can't break that treaty because God's honor is at stake. And because of God's honor, they must honor the treaty. And therefore, they cannot simply break treaty because they've been lied to by their given arts. They are compelled now and forced to continue to honor God by upholding the agreement they've they've entered into. And this is going to provide for them great problems in the future. You know, I don't think that you and I sometimes think about the long-term effects of allowing ourselves to be deceived into sin. When I see marriages break down and I see the consequences on the children, the consequences on each of the man and the woman in that breakdown and how this has a long-term effect on their lives. 
if only somehow God could have given them a little bit of insight into how this would affect the future lives of those who are involved. Perhaps they would have had second thoughts about what they did. When a man or woman gets into an adulterous relationship, they're not thinking about the consequences of that. I was reading an article just yesterday in the Daily Telegraph. Read it if, if you've got access to the Daily Telegraph. It's about a, an a ex-NRL wife. And she exposes some of what she had to endure being a wife married to one of these NRL players. You go read the article for yourself. It's the kind of stuff that she had to endure and the devastating effects of those are just voluminous. And then I read recently a book of a young woman who entered into prostitution in Australia, in Melbourne, and she gathered a whole lot of stories from prostitutes across the world, the USA, the UK, Switzerland, Australia, to tell their stories. They've come out of prostitution. And you can't read that book without there being tears either in your face or in your heart. You just can't. The effects that that has on the lives of those women they never recover, not fully. This woman has been, got married subsequent and has children, but she still has sleepless nights. She still wakes up in sweats. It's still continuing to dog her. She'll never escape the scarring that took place as a result of that sin, and at the time it seemed so attractive, so compelling, some of the stories are of young women who've been raised in Christian homes. And when we think about how the effects are going to cause us to suffer well into the future, and others, because sin is never done in isolation, perhaps that will help us to realize the peril of not inquiring of the Lord and asking for strength to protect us and to shield us and to watch over us and to give us what we don't have, the ability to resist those things when they come tapping on, on our shoulder. Look at the devastating effects for the Gibeonites. How would you like to be in a position of slavery because of a treaty your parents, 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 parents had entered into long before you were even a thought of. Imagine if you are now confined to working in a slave kind of situation as a result of decisions made by someone so far back in your life, hundreds of years, that you had no control over. But you were enslaved now for the rest of your life to function in that way. How would you feel? You can imagine these Gibeonites now that are going to be woodcutters and are going to have these menial tasks that are no longer going to be a free people, constantly going to act as servants towards Israel because of this treaty, because of their sin, because of their lies, because of deceiving Israel. And how many generations successively after them would look back upon their, their, this generation and just wish they had done something differently. But it's too late then. I don't think sometimes we realize the, the wake that, is, that comes as a result, like a boat that when it goes in the water and you see the ripples move out and out and out and out and out, that our sin can have in the future. Sometimes we think we can limit it to ourselves. But we then at that point we don't even think about how it's affecting us internally. And how that then inevitably works its way out externally. Remember the story of 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 24, David and Uriah. Remember David? What's he doing? He's out on his roof. He's looking around. He sees Bathsheba naked, 
bathing. He should have been out with his troops on war, but he's not. He summons her to come. He sleeps with her. She falls pregnant. He's got to get rid of the pregnancy. Easy solution. Get Uriah, her husband, back because no one knows or no one can see yet. He'll sleep with her and then, you know, whether it's a month here or there, who's going to know? Uriah doesn't sleep with him, her because he's an honorable man. So David said, well, in that case, put him on the front lines and he sends a note back to his commander. He's put on the front lines and sure enough, exactly what David wants to happen happens. A millstone gets chucked down and he dies. Now David can remarry. He can marry Bathsheba and who's going to know? But God knows and God sees. And what are the consequences of that? A child dies. Is it the child's fault? No. Nope. It's David's fault. And what we need to understand is sometimes the consequences of our sin can be more devastating for those who are connected to us than it may be for us. I mean, David weeps. He spends a week praying and pleading with God in the temple and asking that God would somehow spare the child till eventually his servants are so embarrassed because the child's dead, they don't know how to tell him, and David recognizes that something's going on and he gets the information out of them. And then when you think of David's son, Absalom, how David did not parent Absalom properly, and how the consequences of that had on the kingdom so that David at some point has his whole power usurped by Absalom, and David's got to flee away from Jerusalem while his son acts as king and then eventually his son is killed and, and what happens, the, they come back from the battle and the men come back and tell David, your son is dead and what does David do? He weeps and he weeps and he weeps till eventually the commander of the army comes and says, come on David, you can't keep weeping like this. Your soldiers have just gained a victory. Go and spend some time with them. The devastating consequences of sin, of compromise, and so you can see why it's so important, that little verse in chapter in verse 14, but he did not inquire of the Lord becomes critical in your and my life. If we are going to live in a way that is pleasing to God, if we are going to resist the temptations that come our way, if we are going to be able to live in a way that is pleasing to God, then it is going to require that you and I spend time in the Word of God, time in prayer, time nurturing our relationship with Him. You can't compromise at that level and expect to have an effective Christian life. It just doesn't work. You have to spend time opening that word. You have to spend time reading it. You have to spend time thinking it through. You have to spend time in reflection upon it. You have to spend time working out how it applies to you. You have to spend time asking God how you need to adjust your life so that it will come into conformity to his word. And then when temptation does come, you will be more spiritually equipped to resist and you won't be so easily deceived into succumbing to temptation and compromising. So can I encourage you? Don't make the same mistake as Joshua. God gives us these episodes to teach us and to say to us, even a man like Joshua, who's got such a high standing, even someone like that can make a mess of things. If Joshua is going to make a mess of things, how much more do you and I need to ensure that we are keeping in constant contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. Make prayer a daily moment-by-moment -moment thing. Paul says pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean that Paul never stops praying, but there is constantly throughout the time that Paul is awake, there is a constant sense of the presence of God, and there is a constant sense in which he's praying throughout the day. Is that your experience? Your very spiritual health will be so well served if you continue to nurture that relationship with Jesus. That doesn't mean you'll never fall. Doesn't mean you'll never succumb to temptation. Because none of us will be perfect this side of 
eternity. What it does mean, though, is there will be a greater consistency in your life. And you will find yourself more often than not being able to resist. And when you do fall and you do succumb to temptation, it will become the exception rather than the rule. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word that continues to instruct us and teach us. Thank you for this lesson of Joshua's failure so that we won't fail in the same way that he failed and the leaders failed. So help us in this, Lord. We are dependent upon you. We need your strength. Oh, we need your strength. Daily. Help us not to become complacent. Help us not to become proud. Help us not to think that we can do it without you. Help us to daily surrender to you. To daily put ourselves under the banner of the Lordship of Christ. And help us throughout the day to be men and women of prayer. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.